It was the light that brought painter Vincent van Gogh to this town, so it's fitting that Arles has become France's de facto capital of photography, the art of writing with light. Les Rencontres d'Arles, an annual celebration of that art form, with 40 exhibitions showcasing the very best in artistic imagery from around the world. This year, there's a focus on the women who were pioneers in a male-dominated sector. Susan Maselas and Marta Gentilucci are showing how an aging body can be a poignant reminder of the passage of time. And Babette Mangold, the French photographer, is being honoured with a special prize for a career spanning more than five decades. Now we're off to meet another veteran of photography, Mitch Epstein, whose unique vision of India is on display at the Abbé de Montmajour, just outside of Arles. Mitch Epstein, hello, thanks for joining us. Now, this exhibition transports us to India through your eyes, specifically to the period 1978 to 1989. Tell us a bit about how you arrived in India with your camera and what were the first impressions that really stayed in your mind's eye? I had a, a young Indian friend, Mira Nair, who's become a very successful filmmaker. She said, I'd like to go back to India. She was studying in university at Harvard. And would you like to come with me? And I took a leap of faith. I'm from a small New England uh, town in Massachusetts, quite provincial. The idea of India, the other, uh, was thrilling, but also a little daunting, a little frightening. Um, the most overwhelming um, impression I had was how things that were private in the way I grew up, and even in New York, were very public in India. Some of the most striking photos uh, for me in that show were of female cabaret performers who you depict very freely, and I wondered how difficult it was to gain access to them, to gain their trust. Part of what's special about this exhibition is that I'm showing two of the films that I worked on with Mira, India Cabaret, which was a documentary, uh, and Salam Bombay. India Cabaret was shot in 1984. I did the cinematography for the film. The film was really asking questions about the stereotypes of Indian women. After I spent time shooting the film, when we wrapped the film, I decided I wanted to spend a week making still pictures. Where I gained from the trust that had been built over time, they were comfortable with me because I didn't understand. They were speaking multiple Indian languages. I didn't understand everything that they said. And they, they just, you know, they, they, they were trusting, which was great. That outsider status that you mentioned, being an American with an Indian family, gave you that dual perspective. And that juxtaposition of East and West is quite striking in a photograph you made at Juhu Beach, where we see tourists luxuriating and uh, Indian men in the foreground. How did you observe the relationship between Indians and Westerners at that time? First of all, it was really interesting to go to a country that was not allied with the United States. So there was no Coca-Cola. There were, there were products either that were Indian generated or from the Soviet Union. But as I went along and got to know Mira's family, and ultimately we, we married in 1981, I became part of an Indian family. I had a unique advantage uh, because of that, where I was part insider and part outsider, um, and really felt a kind of freedom uh, to respond in a very personal way. I was very aware of uh, of the complexity uh, of being an outsider uh, in a country where uh, there was a privilege uh, with that outside status, uh, and that you know that 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 the tension in that picture I think is um, um, speaks to a lot of the uh, experience that I had in India. Well, the so-called outsider looking in is a strong theme at a number of exhibits this year at all. The post-colonial perspective of Ghanaian photographer James Barner takes in life in both Accra and London in the second half of the 20th century. And several generations later, Maya Ines Tuam is exploring the legacy of her Algerian ancestors with a series of images that play with artistic codes and references. Clovis Kasali went to meet them both. Designed by Frank Gehry, the Luma Tower is a cultural landmark of Arles. 
This art centre currently celebrates the works of James Barner. The Ghanaian photographer moved to London in 1959. One morning, a newspaper asked him to go to Covent Garden Market. I saw things different from what I was used to. I should have interviewed everybody that I photographed, but I didn't talk to anybody. In fact, those pictures have not been published. You know, it should have been published as a story, either a black man's view of Covent Garden. He photographed the African diaspora and documented the end of colonialism. He returned to Accra in the 1970s to share knowledge, establishing the country's first color photo processing lab. And photography is so influential. But if one becomes a photographer, one should have good education so that he has good purpose of using it. At 93 now, I see I'm leaving. But before I leave, I'm noticing that I'm being uh, noted to be an inspirer, especially from the young ones. This is what, something that I'm very proud of. In a quiet part of Arles lies La Madeleine, a new artist's residence. It offers Maya Inès Twam a chance to make contacts. She grew up in France and was 25 years old when she discovered Algeria, the country of her parents. I tell fictional stories about migration using typical objects that become elements in my pieces. I look for these objects in France, but in special shops for the African diaspora, or I borrow them from friends, family or collectors. Her pictures are exhibited in a church along others all competing for the Roderin Discovery Award. Celeste Lewenberg's project also explores family heritage revisiting the works of her mother, a visual artist, punk and feminist. Self-taught photographer Saif Kousmat looks at the endangered oasis in his native Morocco. Arles is a unique opportunity for this new guard to showcase its talent. Mitch, the world of cinema pops up in your photographs, and of course the two films that you worked on with Miranair, your ex-wife, are showing here in Arles, uh, India Cabaret and Salam Bombay. Now, that second film won the Best Debut Feature Prize at the Cannes Film Festival in mm -hmm. 1988, the Caméra d'Or Award, and it zooms in on the life of street children in Bombay, uh, using some non-professional actors, I believe. I wondered, what was the biggest thing you took away from that experience? Well, as a photographer, uh, who was trained with a kind of uh, traditional orthodoxy about being a photographer, which is my business was to be staying behind the camera. Uh, it was a tremendous liberation working on all of the films, but really the, the, the culmination uh, with Salon Bombay where uh, I designed the sets and did all of second unit photography and really had a role in the visual character of the film. Um, and that changed my thinking um, about how to approach my photographic practice. And working in film got me to think harder about how to build pictures that were the distillation of larger experience, but that would be layered spatially and conceptually uh, in a single frame. The theatricality of street life mm. in India, with its vibrant colours, the endless action, is something that's often depicted or can be depicted in a stereotypical, cliched way, almost a romanticisation of some of the poverty and hardship through the aesthetic quality of the images. Was that something you were aware of, you wanted to avoid? In going to India, I did not have a lot of baggage, preconception about how to approach it. It'll, it was a lot looking and studying um, Indian film um, and literature, um, but really allowing myself to be open and to build on the experience with going, coming back and going again, studying the pictures that I was making. I was working freely, I was independent, I wasn't doing commissions, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't responsible as an artist to anybody but myself. Hey, what's interesting is we are also at a time now uh, 
where there are these cultural borders being defined, territorial borders, uh, uh, where it's questioned if you are coming from the outside and stepping into a world that's not your own. I don't ever, and to this day, would never claim something uh, that's not mine as mine. But, but it's so important to have this kind of cross-pollination, to be able to uh, navigate in worlds respectfully, and that's the key, respectfully, that are not your own, um, and to have that dialogue, to have that, you know, to have that communication, I think is important. And it doesn't really, I don't think, threaten the integrity uh, uh, of a cultural domain. Your work is in many ways a discussion about Indian society or distillation, as you say. When you look at that society today, the India of 2022, how does it compare to the India you knew then? Look, it's so hard for me to really comment on the state of things in India today because I haven't been to India, uh, really, unfortunately, since 1990. Well, somehow, you, as you see, in the 80s, I was able to kind of uh, work quite, you know, I wouldn't say invisibly, uh, but it was a little bit more seamless than I think it would be now. There was a little less awareness uh, of the presence of the camera. When I worked with Mira on Salam Bombay in 1987, when we went to shoot uh, in 1987, we had permits to be on the beach. We had a crane. We were weaving a scene into the choreography of this event, but the fundamentalists put a stop to it. We had to shut down. Um, and that has changed. And this is exactly what I'm talking about, that uh, the temples that I went into and that I had access to respectfully visit and photograph, I, many of them I wouldn't have that access to now. Um, and these are kind of things that I think that we are seeing in a cultural way globally that I have a you know, very strong personal opposition to because I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not forward. Mitch Epstein, thank you very much for your time today. And we'll wrap up the show with another exhibit here at Arl, which casts an eye on the clothes we wear and their relationship to our identity. Dress Code brings together dozens of artists from New York to Nigeria and outfits from the sequins of the drag scene to the traditional garments worn by Zapotec women in Mexico. Otherwise, do join us for more arts and culture here on France 24. Amazing nature, unpronounceable volcanoes, Bjork and Game of Thrones. They're just some of the things you might think of relating to Iceland. But did you know this tiny island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is one of the most creative nations in the world? Join us on the Isle of Artists to find out why. Encore, presented by Eve Jackson on France 24 and France24.com.